R.I.P. Laura Johnson, our unheralded, underheralded, I should say, underdog Star Trek tech pioneer. Today on episode 363 of Trekland Tuesdays Live with me, Dr. Trek Larry Nemechek, coming at you here from the heart of Trekland <laughs> through Portal 47 and, yes, Trekland Treks, your customized away mission to actual filming sites. Get Check it all out at treklandtreks.com. Love to have you with us someday. Hey, we are here for some clarity, sanity, and the big picture, or a bigger picture, and all things Star Trek. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, welcome. Please feel free to keep the conversation going. Comment away. All right. It's another week. <clears throat> Voice sounds a little better. A little better. We had a Will Rogers event, big event this weekend. <laughs> but my three weekends of talking are done now, I hope. And we're looking back at the news. There's a lot of news going on with Paramount and Skydance. The first round of the chips falling, not totally un unaware not totally unforeseen. And here's a program note. I'm going to be on the seventh rule today at five Pacific, seven Eastern with Riot and Rock and the gang. Hi everybody to talk about the implications of the Skydance Paramount deal finally coming into place and proceeding as we plan. Uh, I just realized, didn't think it was that big a deal, but I saw some headlines that could be misleading and maybe that's what the seventh rule gang wants to talk about. So I'll be over on their show at five Pacific seven here in just a little bit. But today, um, aside from noting that and looking at what's happening in Trek world, we don't have any more fresh Trek until what is it? Is it October? Is it, is it October 12th? I believe look at me. I think so. Uh, sorry. October 24th is the Lord X first and second episode premiere. And then weekly after that, uh, through the end of the year, right up to the holidays. So we're in a time here where we're enjoying the conventions. We're, we're looking at all the news. The shows are in production or getting there. So this week over the weekend, I had some, well, rather sad news. Uh, it was a catch up kind of a moment, but I saw where Laura Johnson had passed. Now I know a lot of you are going who, what, where? So Laura was an amazing soul born with several severe birth defects, especially with the neck, especially in the heart. And I say this because I'm going to only say it a couple of times in, in deference to her wishes and the family's wishes. A lot of you, especially if you've been around Star Trek for a long time, if I showed you the cover for Mr. Scott's Guide to the Enterprise in the 80s, boom, yeah. This was, she wrote this, she wrote this as Shane Johnson. Uh, Laura transitioned at the age of 50. It was after her Star Trek and Star Wars Trek times. For the last few years, she's reinvented herself a little bit. Still a big, huge fan. She's an author, has her own a novel and novel series, the Ice novel and Ice series. Still out there, still available. But through her entire life was beset by several congenital things her body was fighting herself over. And even after a transition, issues with her neck and issues with her heart were um, compounding. And the fact is that when I saw some of these notes, and you did too, not till after the weekend, but I spoke with author Kevin Neese, who many of you may know, who is a close friend, actually had been her caregiver for the last seven years. The cause of death Thursday, he found her, checked in on Friday, was congenital heart failure. She was uh, 64, would have been 65 in November, I believe, October. Yes. And it had been declining health for the last few years. Now, what's interesting is, say all this, if you were a fan in the 80s, you know, <laughs> you knew that Star Trek revival fandom started off with a bang in the 70s and then was a little low there in the 80s for a while. We only had the movies, which those of you who remember the fallow years with only the JJ movies know that a movie every couple of years does not feed your Star Trek habit, especially one that had just been stoked, right? The first wave of fandom. And Laura was, was a big part of that. And if you don't know, I'm going to talk about that, but I just want to say that thank you, Kevin, for clarifying. Thanks you, Mike Akuda, a few other folks who are working on the Roddenberry archives now with uh, Toyo. The digitizing of assets finally into a, into an archive that I know Rod is, is proud of and Trevor. She has a, 
Laura has a very unique place, well, a couple of ways, <laughs> in Star Trek lore. And I'm talking completely on her works, completely on her efforts as an author, as a draftsman, an artist, graphic artist, and someone who loves Star Trek dearly and loved the graphics of Star Trek and loved, yes, love Star Trek canon. And we will get into that in just a second. But I do want to say thanks to Kevin, who caught me up to speed. Uh, she did pass, still in the Greater Dallas era in uh, Richardson, where, was, where I, I knew her. Had her as a guest up to ThunderCon a few times after these books appeared. And even shared a Dallas Cowboys game. One of the two times I got to go to a Cowboys game was with Laura. Pre-transition in the in the 80s, leading into the 90s. Just to say that there's, I want to make sure I get this right, um, there's memorial services are going to be on the way. Everything will be localized to, to Dallas, of course, around the world. People who either know of or were aware and didn't make the connection recently um, may want to know about that. There is about to be, if not right now, a GoFundMe for a memorial fund for her. Laura's son, Daniel and brother Sean are in charge of the family. Kevin niece is helping out too. And those that she was communicating with regarding the archives, uh, Mike and others are going to be uh, in the loop on all this as well. But I wanted to get back to, because she made the decision to transition, she felt at 50, which would be 2009. And here's the thing that was 15 years ago. We've come through, we're still evolving on how we understand the spectrum of gender and all of that. And on top of that, sometimes those who see medically necessary transitioning have other afflictions as well. I've known folks in this matter and dealing with the heart, not formed properly, functional, but always kind of fighting itself. And even neck and leaving the neck open to some really unique kind of infections. I don't mean to be too graphic here, but it was, it's amazing that Laura had the life she did had this output. And I should say, not just for Star Trek, but the same kind of thing for Star Wars. So there's going to be news coming out about memorials. There's going to be news coming out about a, you know, a standard obituary here. This has just been the last few days. You'll see more and some of her work hopefully turning up with the archives. Just want to say, for those of you who have no clue, even about who Shane Johnson was. Let me, let's, let's reset a little bit here. Let's go back in time, as I said, to the 70s. Star Trek burst out. What was one of the biggest markers, I think, that led to the movie? The animated series, but really the movie and the movie series? What told Hollywood that this failed three little three-year little show had some legs to it? Well, sure, it was the protests, and it was the petitions, and it was the infamous Save Star Trek campaign, the biggest ever for a show up until that time, and maybe since. Sure, it was the fact that conventions were starting to happen for this dead show, and people were turning up. Sure, it was the fact that this did not go away. It did not follow the main. <laughs> it was not the business model of most canceled three-year TV shows. The syndication made so many local stations happy with their 800% rise in after school or dinner time or even after local news at 10 or 11. That time slot was huge. But the other thing that blew the doors off of this for the money world was the Star Trek technical manual being on the New York Times bestseller list for either 12 or 16 weeks. We're, we're trying to knock this down. But still, that's a hell of a long time, or as my mom said, something that didn't really exist. <laughs> What's amazing is the tech manual sold on the back of the classic, iconic Enterprise blueprints, Franz Joseph Snobelt's blueprints and then technical manual. Blueprints didn't track because they weren't a book, and so the publishing world didn't really pay attention to them. But the technical manual did just as well, if not better, and dollar signs rang out in the eyes of those. And then Star Wars came along, and boom, we're back with movie, movie, TV series, now a movie, right? With a whole host of licensed goods to meet that huge audience demand. Well, the motion picture wasn't quite the boom, boom, boom that people thought on the Star Wars model. Although it did make the most money of any Star Trek movie until the inflated ticket prices of the Kelvin movies all these years later. It still made enough money, plenty of money, to guarantee there'd be a sequel on some budget model. That all happened, but the huge publishing empire that was part of the merch uh, title when Simon & Schuster in the Paramount family 
got a hold of the license rights. So the novelization sold well. You know, there's tons of they're collectibles now. The the sticker, the graphic sticker book, and the make your own costume book, and the fold apart paper folding enterprise and model kit. Not so much. Not so much. And there was a pouch of blueprints, David Kimball's drawings from the art department, right, right onto uh, professionally printed paper stock, just like in a pouch, just like the old Ballantine originally, did not sell near as well. And they were actually probably, they were more direct. <laughs> they were more direct from the horse's mouth with all the background research that went Andy Probert, et cetera, et cetera, is work that went into the making of the model, the movie model. And the interior, all of that, all that pre-retconning was fleshed out upset. So that didn't sell well. So guess what? Everything shrunk back for Wrath of Khan, including the publishing program. Still had novelization, still had little photo novel books. You had one-off bits and pieces, but this army of publications did not happen. Through two, and then for three, there wasn't even a making of book. And then four. Now, four, four lit the fire, right? But before Star Trek four in 1986, the one with the whales, somebody living in Dallas, Texas, who was a draftsman and a huge Star Trek fan, pitched the infantly, I mean, the equally feral, babyish, undeveloped, not near as sophisticated as it was soon to be, licensed department at, um, at Paramount, and said, hey, it's overdue time to do a blueprint book. Let's do a blueprint pouch for the Enterprise A and update it now. Nobody wanted to go there. So a counteroffer came back. How about we do a standard book with engineering drawings? And that is how Mr. Scott's Guide to the Enterprise came about. Not only was it not a hardcore techie book like the tech manual, but it still had, it had photos. It had plenty of drawings. And these were all hers. All of this was hers. What the selling point really was, there's props in here like you expect in graphics. The big thing was going to be no one had any word about details of the plans, details of some of the other things that the, that the blueprints even didn't have in detail, and things that had been altered. Just a feel-good, even though a little bit watered-down version of the hardcore tech manual we'd had 10 years earlier, right? 15 years, not 10 years earlier. She sold this book. She sold the idea for this book. And one of the best stories in the world, if you were lucky enough to be part of a, a live con appearance where she was in the 80s and 90s, you heard the story of this. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> we were so hungry for material in the 80s. We were hungry for more Star Trek, period. The next generation was coming along slowly, but these early movies came along and proved their point because at the time... The paradigm of Star Trek was Kirk, Spot, McCoy, Scotty, Sue, Uhura, Chekhov, and this Enterprise show. No one knew how to bust out of that yet. We weren't into a multi a multiverse. Uh, not a multiverse, a multi-platform verse, the MCU, the STU, Star Trek universe. And what uh, she was smart enough to get done, and what I was very jealous of doing, was what I had wanted to do at the time, which was a follow-up book called The Worlds of the Federation. That was a Star system by star system, culture by culture, approach to all the members of the Federation. This is from a year later, and this is growing out a lot of the work that Jeff Mandel and the circle coming out of the uh, the New York truck mafia was doing with the Starfleet handbook and his self-published Starfleet um, officer's manual and, and the army that I was attached to, the core group that I was attached to. I did not know. I did not know Laura, Shane, working on this book, but I loved it. I saw where a lot of the pieces that I had put <laughs> into my charts that wound up being in the paper Star Trek maps, 1980, wasn't a big seller, but picked up on a lot of things. A lot of the things that I did, she had no clue about, but they wound up in here trying to keep some semblance of continuity. Again, before Mike Okuda touched anything, before the next generation was a gleam in anyone's eye, before we all knew what a kudograms and the quadrant system would do to the backgrounding of Star Trek and our alien races and all of that. Now, what's interesting is this came out in, I think, 87. 
the point being that there was room to get a few of the very, very, very earliest. Oh, 89. This was 89. A few of the very earliest new aliens, new cultures from next generation found their way in here. But the Binars are in here. There's the uh, Saurians. A lot of the, mo a lot of the movie. She got to work on this. Got to work on this. Then, by that time, the third season had come down. The fourth season was approaching. And by that time, Next Generation was exploding so much. And the work that Mike and Rick Sternbach was doing, they approached pocketbooks and licensing about doing their own technical manual based on the technical notes they'd already been writing since the pilot days. And so with that in mind, there was no need for an outsider to sketch together work like this, although it was phenomenal and amazing. And so many things got furthered along from all the iterations of, of licensed, but not screen canon because, Hey, I would have loved it if this had been screen canon, put it on screen, get it in a story. Somehow they had other things to do with their screen time. I don't know, but we did get the Federation council scene in the fourth movie. We did get that. As that was happening, there still was no technical journal. And as that passed and the way that licensing contracts can slice up a pie, sometimes a little maddeningly, if you're one of the other pie holders. But in this case, once the contract was set up for Mike and Rick to eventually do the technical manual, and it was a year delayed, wound up coming out with my first year at Next Generation Companion. But before that happened, Starlog was also had the official magazines and the official magazines back then were episode synopsis and maybe one behind the scenes interview when the signs feature grab some graphics and throw on a two page spread. And they also did those softbound books like, like that. And um, she actually did this one, which was a huge seller because nothing existed yet. So yeah, in between times, this is, I want to catch the date on this. Oh, this is 92. This is, the, talk about a slice in that pie. The, uh, the tech manual was a little bit delayed and came out right about the same time. The tech manual wouldn't have the cool fold. This actually had like fold outs. Where are we? There you go. There's your D fold out. So the work was there. This was a Starlog magazine. So this was a licensed magazine special not a book. So it was okay. We can't have our two licensees fighting each other or can we? But the bottom line is that this was also Laura's contribution to Star Trek. See, I've still got it in the magazine bag. And at the same time through Starlog, she wound up doing a lot of the same work on, we were right in the heart of or the, the, the fallow time for Star Wars. And she got to do some of the same kind of work, the Star Wars technical journal. Technical manual, technical journal. Notice that it's a technical journal magazine, not a technical manual book. All righty. So, yeah. And I know in the day she, free transition, was speaking at conventions in the region. If someone was smart enough to fly her in as a guest, cool. I know I had had him up as uh, as a guest twice at ThunderCon, and we got to know each other. Got my books signed, of course, signed with the birth name. But uh, see, uh, did I show that? Yay! Okay. It was a rare treat, because I know it was not a, a national guest, really, sadly. And so we move along into the 90s. The, the, new, the licensed works come out now. There's fact files overseas. Uh, pocket. So the encyclopedia from the Akutas comes along, the chronology, my books are coming, a lot more DS9, Voyager, everything is on the way. People are still starving for cool behind the scenes books, but she's not part of it. And then by the mid-aughts, uh, doing some Star Wars along the way, working on her own novels. And then, as I said, about 2009, just made the decision to transition, partly just as a health saving measure and corrected some health issues again in that that unfortunate uh, circle of of congenital body issues that plagued her all the way through the the neck was still an issue heart was still an issue and indeed from 09 transition but still suffered from some of those other issues the heart and neck issues and again um 
congenital heart failure diagnosis about seven years ago. And Kevin, as I mentioned, was a, was a caregiver those last few years. Now, I was thrilled to make the acquaintance, be a guest, sign books, go to a Cowboys game. But what the oddity of time I had no clue about was that fast forward 20 years, it's the mid-teens. I'm first starting to work on the con of wrath. The word is getting out. And I get a message. Realize I hadn't heard from Shane in ages. I get a message from Laura Johnson. She catches me up on everything that's happened. She's not ready for a camera interview, but she just finished the last phase and was, as those who transitioned to, was, were dealing with not their own, well, their own thoughts and needs, but the greater good. And so she, here's someone who'd had a public profile. And to fandom, and in a world that blew up with all the goodies, that Mike, the Akutas, that Rick Sternbach, that Doug Drexler, that John Eves, the shows and the behind the scenes. There was so much good stuff here that, you know, a lot of a lot of what was in Worlds of Federation had been superseded. Not so much the A ship, not so much the Enterprise A, because it was a class basically left to history, especially after the TOS movies went their way. Only uh, one more after the book there. And... Lo and behold, lo and behold, she reaches out to me and says, Larry, I see you're working on the Connor Wrath. Uh, I was part of that. <laughs> and I'm like, you were there? You were one of the attendees? Are you worked? She said, no, no, no. This is crazy. But one of the uh, ideas they had for this pie in the sky show convention that was going to be the biggest, coolest, neatest, biggest thing ever. And as we say in the tagline, did not quite wind up that. Uh, did not quite go according to plan, but they commissioned a giant Enterprise A to be built as a door prize, as the world's greatest door prize. And she bid for it. Now, here's the thing. Go between friend Walter Koenig, who was helping kind of be the Hollywood connection to get all the actors to this thing, but had been around cons and fandom and knew folks and knew... What a great archivist and draftsman and model builder that she was. And again, we're mixing eras here. We're talking about the 80s, early 80s, before the books, before Mr. Scott's Guide, three, four years before it. Walter got them in touch. And so for the grand bid of 1500 made basically a vacuum formed, contracted out to have a shop build a giant four foot long enterprise a with some internal lighting beautiful with its own case over a month's time <laughs> like insanely short deadline of course and got to build it did all the lettering you know, after the bang frame was built after the shell was built it painted it did the decals did the lettering did the internal lighting the control had the case built for it delivery picked it up from houston up to dallas area and took it away with the $1,500 check and promises of seats and meals and hotel and all of that as a sidebar. Thank you. No word, no nothing, show up and get it. As want in the Con of Wrath story, she showed up with a friend. Model had been taken away already. No hotel room, <laughs> no meals. No special anything. Of course, the show itself was, there was no need for special seating. And in the end, the $1,500 check bounced. Uh, bounced to a bank that was not happy. She said, whoa, 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 That's, that was you know the check that she wrote. Anyway, her check that she wrote to the model maker wasn't going to go through. So we had a domino effect, panicked. She got back on the phone with Walter. Walter covered the check until they could do something about it. So then the infamously, right? Nothing ever happened. So Production Ventures International, she's calling, madly calling to get her money, to find out what happened. She doesn't even know, she was there, had to do her own, like so many, had to do their own payments. Never saw the model. Most people had no clue what was going on. She had no idea even what the fate of it was. A few days later, she's called. Well, she's calling the offices constantly, and as they're cleaning out the production office uh, with with no money in sight and all this crashing and burning, 
as a dream for the future. One janitor was in the office, answered the phone, and on the phone told her, yeah, there's a model over here in the corner. It's still sitting here. And she said, fine. <laughs> got a truck, came to Houston, got a friend, got a truck, went over. The guy let her take the model. So karmic, karmic justice there. Don't know what was going to happen to it. But um, they got the model back. Walter helped her find a buyer for the full price. So Walter got reimbursed. She was clear, aside from having this insane story, this odyssey. And that was 1982. Did not know what was to come. And I will just share this. This is something she used to share live at cons a lot with a slideshow. But as I found out, sometimes when you're an official author for pocketbooks, that means diddly squat when you get to the real world of the real stages and the people whose lives are just wrapped around making movies, supporting the people that make movies, answering the phone for people that make movies, guarding the phones, guarding the sets and the stages for those who make movies. And there's a long, long hysterical saga of in the days before now, before licensing was savvier, before everybody knew how all this worked, when even in Star Trek world, as I discovered, the magic and the and the hurry, hurry, rush, rush, and the coolness factor of merch spinoff works like tech manuals and making of books and action figures and model kits, that was all completely divorced from the reality of the concept. Some people in offices might know in licensing, but the licensees aren't the makers. You have the makers who get the license from licensing and licensees who then have to deal with production people to get reference. And kiddos, it was a prehistoric time still in the, 10 years after Star Wars. It was still a prehistoric time. At least it was over on the Star Trek side. Star Trek three, it happened. Star Trek four was about to come out, but it had been filmed. And in August, 1986, Laura tells me the story. I don't have it on camera. She was not ready to be on camera, but as we talked about the Con of Wrath in the same call, I said, you have to tell me the story of your trip to Paramount to get research for Mr. Scott's Guide in August of, 90, of, August of, of 1986. We are about three months away from Star Trek IV coming to screens. Even more so, we're about one month away from Bob Justman and Eddie Milkus making their tour of the stages buried in a foot of cat shit, feral cats, as they look to see what they can survey and use for this new series called The Next Generation. It was such an amazing time. And in the middle of all this, here comes Laura with camera and measuring tape and all this to get actual reference because it's drafts from the blueprints. And not only does she want to be exacting, she knows, as I did a few years later, whether you're talking about text or you're talking especially about techie blueprints and drawings, you better, by God, have it accurate, or fans will eat you alive. And they will eat alive pocketbooks for slapping Star Trek on this crap and trying to sell it to us. So there was a lot of pressure there, just as it was on me. I totally empathize with her. And the saga, it's like the worst sitcom ever. Shows up. Nobody has all the assurances and guarantees of what's supposed to happen. Ralph Winter is the, the head honcho there. He's the production side producer. I worked with Harv Bennett through all the middle movies until the last one when Harv left, when his movie wasn't taken, until six. Uh, but Ralph still worked on six. Harv didn't. So two through six, Harv was a major hand there. And on site, did not come and go with the movie company, right? He's the major domo here. They get it all worked out in advance. The problem is when she gets to the lot with her 3D camera for photographing, and which is unheard of. Remember my story about Jean and not having a camera? Oh, my God. The days when your camera was part of your phone. I wish those had arrived about 30 years earlier. We would have so much more Star Trek material. But they didn't. But here's, here's Laura burdened down with measuring tape and note paper and all the things. The first day leaving camera behind and checks in via Richard Arnold, then Gene's assistant, who's also entertaining two German fans who are probably running a convention. Anyway, the hours tick by. 
The hours tick by. Nothing is going. Finally, they go to the sets. He gives the tour and wants to leave. And Shane's like, I have hours of work to do here. And it's already after lunch. I have hours of work to do. So it, it's just a comedy of errors. The mon if, you, if one more person had said, you're not supposed to have a camera on. Anyway, gets to the end of the day. She's planned it so that she's there Friday, has a tourist weekend set up. Saturday, Sunday, the studio's closed. It didn't have to be, but it is. And Monday, flying back to Dallas at four, I believe, afternoon. And what finally happens is that knowing that pressure finally calls, I, I, the transcript is better. I'm not going to read the transcript. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do the audio. That's that we'll we'll use that. But the gist of it is Friday afternoon, got a message through. Remember, no cell phones. Got a message through to Ralph. Ralph Winter called back. She's like, not quite in tears, but just like, like, I've paid on my own dime to come here. I have a book to deliver officially. It's a license on contract that I'm supposed to deliver in just a few weeks. And I'm supposed to come in and get measurements because there's nothing in licensing that's up to the specs that I need, which is true. You'd have lots of separate. If you had art department blueprints, you would still need. And she got some of those. She did get that, but it took two or three hours of her day. Just wanted to have actual colors and you know aspects of things. Got in, didn't finish, was going to be booted out, got a message to Ralph Winter, told the saga, and Ralph Winter finally got it and said, okay, you're flying Monday. Can you be at the lot at 8 a.m.? Yes, sir. All right. You can be there at 8 a.m. We will lock you in. You can text, not text. What am I doing? Call this number and then they will come let you out and you can get away in time for your phone and you'll have those hours. And it's like, okay, relief. And if Friday was a shit show, Monday was even more so. Nobody has a clue what's going on. Nobody's been told the Ralph plan and it's comedy to go through security secretaries to security guards to the star trek office secretary to the secretary going the head of security to, this time has the 3d camera uh it's like takes like viewmaster pictures to to ralph's home number and his wife and every time the call goes something like hi Tell the story, tell the story. I'm here, I'm official, I'm authorized. I talked to Ralph, blah, blah, blah. I have my digital camera. Oh, you take can't, you can't take a camera on the sets. No one ever takes a camera on the sets. I know, that's why this is special. Call the, each person, each person in turn, you go through the whole rigmarole. Okay, you can't take a camera on the sets. Nobody takes a camera on the sets. I know, that's, okay. So seven or eight iterations of this later, finally, they get to Ralph. No one believes what's going on. She gets to go to the stage. She's locked in, takes her pictures, and then gets there and realizes that it's, what did they use in Star Trek IV? The new bridge repainted white. The old bridge repainted white. All the other sets that have been around since motion picture are ratty. They've been redressed. They're half in, half out. Captain Kirk's quarters, Admiral Kirk's quarters, had been almost used for an apartment for Jillian in Star Trek IV, and then they decided not to, they didn't need it. Very, nothing was pristine except for the transporter room. And having said that, she still photographed everything, took measurements, yada, yada. And of course, we know, and there were probably some pages left out of this, I think, Mr. Scott's Guide is a benefit for that. There's a lot of one-off aspects to this book that uh, don't really fit. But they're there because she had the information and could draw it and draft it. And we're all the better for it. And along the way, the licensing contact at the studio, she was trying to get something out of her. And they were like, you can't. Gets a call. Why are you calling Ralph Winter at home? You can't do that. It was, it was insane. I had to. How am I supposed to do this? You just don't call. You don't call. We do not bother the important producers. Uh, that Yes. And screamed and yelled at trying to deliver the book. This is why I say, and if, and for fans in the 80s and 90s, before Laura kind of dropped out of view to undertake her grand saga for her transitioning and to come back better, she told that to several audiences, but it wasn't repeated. And then Star Trek took off on its own. I don't have camera film of this. 
but we have this entire long audio. We have this Conorvast story on audio and the uh, Paramount. No holes barred. I know she told a redacted story at times. It was a little easier on all the personalities she had to interact with. People doing their jobs in 1986, it was prehistoric compared to the savvy world where, you know, you come up with an idea and you pre-plan how the comic book, the movie, the TV series, and the animated series, and the entire merch line fit together. And you go in to pitch this at the right places, and they expect you to have all that. We live in a much different world now today <laughs> than back then, when I think one of the things she's finally said was, look, I'm going to make, you're going to make a lot more money on this than I do. In fact, she got home Monday, Tuesday, the next day after she got home, uh, editors at Pocketbook called. What the hell did you do in LA? What did you do at Paramount? Like she'd stolen the half the studio. So she tells the whole story. And the upshot is they said, do you still have your pictures? <laughs> do you still have your slides? Because people threatened to take her, the licensing people threatened to take the film out of her camera for what she'd shot. I, I know. It was for the book, the Your Project. That wasn't available elsewhere. Excuse me for bumping my head on the ceiling of. Yeah. So Dave Stern, then the Star Trek editor of Pocket says, according to Laura, well, did you get them? <laughs> did you get on with them? Like, of course I did. It's like, good, good, good. Okay. But she had them. Occasionally you would see her at a convention with the slideshow. But other than that, most of the world has not seen these slides. And I have to say, aside from being shocked and saddened when I heard that uh, Laura had passed, my fourth or fifth reaction was, oh, no, I hope those slides are in a good place because we had talked about finding a home for them. I knew she was working with the Roddenberry Archives. I was hoping that that was part of what she was contributing, consulting about. Turns out that that had not come up yet. She was working with the things related to the A and the refit model. Some of the information she had, some of her original source material. But the slides themselves from this weird slice in time when the original motion picture A set, you know, refit sets were as they were in between. <laughs> it's a lot of them not touched since they were used on two and three on Wrath of Khan and Sir. If they weren't used for, you know, the only thing was the bridge. Everything else was still sitting, looking like it had looked for Search for Spot two years earlier, or maybe even further back if it wasn't used in Search for Spot. These are precious, precious, precious images. Um, Kevin reassures me that uh, the family is well aware that they're in good hands, that they were going to try to get them to the project, that Mike tells me that something was going to happen, but he wasn't sure exactly what. He knew something was coming, but he wasn't even sure of the material yet. So... On that front, everything seems fine. So I wanted to, so it's funny how the world works. The longer you're around this crazy franchise, this beloved franchise, the, the you know, Laura's first chapter as an author who brought so much joy to people, the, the preface to that chapter was the Con of Wrath that is actually a chapter two when it comes to recording that and documenting that. And we have the audio for that that we'll use in the documentary when we're, when it's finished. I know that will be another one of the wacky little tales, right? The door prize enterprise model that was not door prized <laughs> and went back to its owner and still found a good home. No harm, no file, except another crazy chapter. And then, yes, I haven't said much about it, but yes, as a pioneering member of the trans community in our realm, aside from that was not, it was not Laura's thing. She was not an activist. She was doing what was right for her. And she was well aware that she, in her words, had to drop out of fandom for a time. It would be confusing. It would be controversial in some facets. It was just the aughts as it was. But coming back, and about the time she was ready to come back, triumphantly make a splash, claim that legacy even more, then her health issues uh, really started to get her down. And I understand there were a couple of times when things were coming together to bring her out to L.A. for events, for work, and her health would just not allow it here in the last few years. So all that to say, um, you know 
you know Scotty's Guide to the Enterprise. You probably know Worlds of the Federation, or you may not. That might have totally preceded your era of fandom, much less the Star Law Guides, or even, this is a Trek audience, even the Star Wars works you would. You may not be familiar, or you might even be more familiar if I said, if you go and Google Laura Johnson, L-O-R-A, you might see her novel Ice and the spinoffs more than you would Trek work and may not make the connection. Well, I'm here to make sure, even per her wishes, to use her transition name of choice, history, we can't undo the history of publications. And that's the, that's the name, Shane is the name that's on her books of that era. And that's one of the, uh, you know, that's one of the issues that this entire field is grappling with, this whole realm. What's, is it by the issues of the person? What's, what's normal, what's protocol? But at least we're out and talking about it. At least it's out in the arena. People are aware that this is just one more, you know, by God, we've, we've grappled with women using their maiden names or not. We've grappled with the DC Fontanas versus the Dorothy Fontanas. I mean, that's a gender issue and ID factor that we've dealt with for ages and lineage and, and looking at legacy of different parts of a career. So no, Laura was, she was not an activist. She wasn't out there. She just wanted to do, she loved her Trek. She loved sci-fi. I think she loved her Cowboys <laughs> and she loved storytelling and was so proud. I know the last few years to have been an a published author. I, it's just maddeningly sad that, and, and I know she had GoFundMes over the, over the past few years uh, for her, just her medical issues, the heart and neck issues and had some, a little relief there. But in the end, not enough was done, could have been done. And uh, we lost, lost her. Talented, brilliant, uh, funny soul. And those who have lived with her, Kevin, and some of the circle there in Dallas that she was uh, familiar with, uh, knew her from that life. I'm, this is hopefully, and you know, Mike, Kuda, others have written testimonials on their pages or on her page. I haven't done that yet. I'm doing it today <laughs> and we'll be doing more as word comes out. This has just been happening the last few minutes. So Kevin, if you, if people want to make memorial gifts, here's some, here's some things. There is a Laura Johnson Memorial GoFundMe to help with the immediate expenses, right? But also if you want to give a memorial gift in her name to uh, the ASPCA, American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the ASPCA is one, the Trevor Project, is another one that supports trans youth as they make their journeys, whether or not they're in support by families. And, uh, or if there is a trans youth organization near you that you support or are aware of, give in her name to that as well. Now, I've just, I'm seeing where the link is up. It's a memorial. I'll put the link here if you want to give that way. I wanted to say that. And speaking of support, uh, Laura's son, Daniel, brother, Sean have been very much in support these last few years, which has made it, uh, wonderful on the transition side, but all the more, uh, you know, bittersweet and, and, and heartbreaking as, uh, nothing could be done for these greater medical issues. My goal here today was a, let the world know, even on hopefully a little bit wider stage. And as you'll be hearing more in the days to come more work her work so far with the Roddenberry archive is going to be thing and her donations of resource and material will be remembered and noted in the archive there. The one that Otoy has been working on both the videoing that you've seen the bits come out and also just the 3d archiving that's happening. Some unique points in the evolution of Star Trek history and backgrounding and canonistaizing and retconning, but even just doing the basic research so we know how to go back and retcon. But uh, Mr. Scott's guide and also the guide to the Federation. Again, a lot of it superseded, but a lot of it perfectly well used and suited. Bits and pieces I've used in cellar cartography because it was gap filling. There was nothing else out there or it was the best of what was, or it was self was a summation of what's it's, you know, you know how canon smoothing and gap filling works. Anyway, so yes, rest in peace, rest in power, whatever your preference is, Laura. Uh, I want the world to know because 
the world had no way to know for so long. She literally dropped out, didn't do conventions, didn't claim her time. We've now had the explosion of new series. We've had the explosion of, well, I mean, the, the latter half of the Berman era, much less the series now. All of that, all of the behind the scenes and technical manuals, the digital world that makes everything so easy to research and spread and possess. And you think back to those analog days of just trying to get someone to listen to her, to let her in, to do her contracted duty with a camera. Because, you know, you can't have a camera on stage. So we're thinking well of Laura. We're remembering you. And uh, going to be watching and supporting how the family and her friends fulfill this legacy. And what happens going forward when there's a memorial, especially and especially how her contributions still ring true. Uh, with the ongoing projects like the Roddenberry Archive. I just wanted you all to know. Talk about connecting dots. There were two or three big dots there that hadn't been connected in a long time. And I wanted to make sure and do it right now. Big thanks, especially right now, to uh, all of our Patreon folk for helping me be here to bring you word and connect those dots about things like Laura, her projects, her long, interesting uh, journey through life. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all of our Patreon folks. This year, more than ever, this month, more than ever, our TTLers, Chuck A., James Kerwin, Diana Hopkins, Jesse at Crusher Convo Podcast, Lawrence Todd, Javier Gunjansen, Justin Porteous, Galinda Bruton, Josh Patton, whoops, Chris Jiggins, Pranakasha Productions, Keith Rombach, Comedy Forecast, and Andrew Jasimski, and our live wires. Robert McLean, Byron Bailey, J.R. Poole, Alan Hoenzi, James, Dave Gregory, Greg Wickstrom, and K.A.C. Shafsky. A lot of folks, again, I was privileged to see at Vegas. It was good to see folks in the flesh, so to speak, live in person. And if you are curious about what's going on, you can do, there you go. $5, $10, very simple, Patreon levels, patreon.com slash Live. I appreciate it for a shout out every week. The TTLers, the live wires get access to our early day, the first few years of Portal 47 backstage creative interviews, right? And it's Tuesday. And yes, we have another great Trek Files up, especially at our new home. All the places you've always gotten Trek Files, you can go there. All the podcast places or our Facebook page. But it's all together, the audio player and the documents and deep links back into Memory Alpha are at Memory Alpha's page now for the Trek Files, which you can get shortcutted to thetrekfiles.com. What a concept. Look up uh, Jeff Stepp, the documentary reality TV producer who's worked with Shatner, worked with Morgan Freeman. Uh, we're looking at some more of, of uh, Gene's science thoughts this week, things out of the files. I think you'll enjoy it. Take a look, take a listen at the Trek Files, wherever fine podcasts are sold. And of course, I'm still hanging out at the old places. Uh, Larry Nimichek on X slash Twitter. Trekland, Larry's Trekland on Facebook and on Instagram. I'm going to make sure and be there. And also, please like and subscribe us on YouTube if you haven't already. If you're not there right now. And if you're coming to us on Twitch and Facebook, sure, like and subscribe there too. But I'd still love it if you would go over and grab the, the YouTube channel. Because, you know, somebody's got to. <laughs> and here you go. Once again, if you've got an itch to come live some Star Trek live, not the stages, not like James Colley has up in New York. I'm talking about the rest of Star Trek, the live outdoor locations of all kinds. Natural man-made buildings. We'll work it out. Your own customized away mission on treklandtreks.com for a day tour, four sites, fast food lunch, you want to do two back-to-back -back and have different itineraries each day? Fine. But you pick it out. I work with you. We coordinate. I concierge you. It's an awesome day. It's an awesome day. That's going to do it here for today. If you're leaving us on YouTube right now, please, please make sure you did subscribe. Leave a comment. And uh, maybe you can join us live some week at 1-ish Pacific, 4-ish Eastern time. Catch us on one of our live channels, especially YouTube. Oh, and if you're leaving us now, though, just take care of your health, would you please? Watch that. Do all the things. 
uh, stay healthy, stay woke, check the sources, make sure what you're reading or hearing is accurate. And then sometimes it still may be something you can't believe and you may want to make yourself do believe. <laughs> That's why I say stay woke, check the sources. And in general, truck well, everybody. <laughs>